Good afternoon. I'm Ariana Cohen Halberstam. I'm the artistic director of Boston Jewish Film. And I'm so glad to be here for our third event as part of our streaming cinema tech. This is a very special one for us. We showed Picture of His Life back in November as part of the 31st annual Boston Jewish Film Festival. We had two amazing screenings of the film um, and we're supposed to bring it back in March. Unfortunately, um, we had to cancel that screening because of world events, um, but we are so glad to be bringing you the film and Q&A now. And we have some very special guests with us here. Uh, first, we have Yonatan Nier, who's the director of tonight's film. He's an award-winning documentary film producer and director um, whose films have shown in Boston. Uh, his debut film, Dolphin Boy, played at the 2011 Boston Jewish Film Festival and received awards at festivals around the world and was nominated for the Israeli Academy Awards. His film, My Hero Brother, also won awards around the film and screened as a co-presentation of Boston Jewish Film Festival and Real Abilities Boston back in 2017. And we brought Yonatan here to Boston back then. Um, it was also this film, Picture of His Life, was the opening night film at Dakavi Film Festival. And Yonatan is also a motivational speaker who's given over 1,300 lectures around the world, including at the UN and the Museum of Tolerance in Los Angeles. We also have a, someone here who you will all recognize from the film you just saw, Amos Nahum, who is a master of photographing big animals worldwide. Uh, there's one swimming up behind him right now. He is one of five people to ever swim and photograph a polar bear underwater. His photos and essays have appeared in publications in, in publications including the National Geographic, Time, Life, and the New York Times. He is a two-time winner in the animal behavior category of the BBC Wildlife Photographer of the Year, and his 2014 TED Talk in the Company of Ocean Giants was met with a standing ovation, and you can watch that online. His photographic vision is to raise awareness of ocean giants in, the, in their habitats. He's also an explorer and leads wildlife photography exhibitions expeditions with his company, BigAnimals.com. Check it out. It will make you want to get back on the road and, and underwater fast. And he is a conservationist who co-founded Israel's Marine National Park on the Red Sea. He recently purchased a home in Yafo and is moving between California and Israel at this time. Welcome. Thank you very much for both of you. <laughs> We're so and, the, and the animal behind me. And the animal behind you. Uh, I guess I, I was going to start with a question about the film, but can you tell us first about this photograph behind you? Um, the photograph is of leopard seal, uh, seen only in Antarctica. It is an animal that hardly nobody have really studied it or researched it. It's very difficult to, uh, to work with them. They are limited period of time. Um, prey mostly on krills, mm. uh, despite the fact that also can feed on um, penguins. And it is one of the subjects that I photographed, that I had the opportunity to photograph when they are playing on the penguins and got tremendous amount of exposure and recognition in the world and one of the prize winning image. And mm -hmm. um, it is one of the animals that I work mostly because they are in a family of endangered, threatened animal and to be able to capture them for the legacy of mankind, what really we have have in the world, if we protect it, we'll stay for long, and if not, what was before on, a, on our planet, as unfortunately we're going to miss some of them. I have, I have quite a few questions about that and about your work as a conservationist, but I want to back up a little bit because um, this film talks about that, and um, Jonathan, you found Amos and, and made this film, and I want to learn a little bit from both of you about how you came to know each other and how this film came to be. Mm. Go ahead, Johnny. <laughs> so, in um, I think it was 2004 or 2005. I um, uh, before that I lived in the States and in different places around the world, and um, and I and 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 I got to a point where I thought to myself, what do I really want to do when I when I be old, you know, uh, or not old but older, you know? What is the thing that I really want to do? And I, I thought that being a wildlife photographer, underwater photographer. Uh, is a photojournalist is a nice occupation to have um, and I searched for someone to um, to teach me to guide me through this uh, process you know and someone recommended me to um, contact Amos Nahum I didn't know who is Amos I have to say before I when 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 this person told me 
uh, to contact him. So I went to the, um, you know, to the internet and I looked at Amos Nahum and then I saw the images and I was like, what the hell is this? You know, I never seen anything like that before. The images were so powerful and unique. It seems like you don't need a signature to recognize them because it was the signature was in the picture. And I said, okay, this person must be an interesting one. I, I must meet him. But um, um, I didn't have the guts to give him a call, to be quite honest, because the, I thought to myself, what am I going to show him? Some pictures of fish that I took in Thailand. Or, and I decided to give up on, on, on calling him. But then he contacted the person who gave me his phone number. The person who gave me his phone number also told him that I'm about to call him. And he, he contacted him and said, tell this, tell this guy to contact me. <laughs> and a week or two weeks later, I already met him first time in France. Um, for the first year or year and a half, our relationship was, uh, were, was very, um, um, you know, focused on professional questions that I asked him. I shared with him images. He gave me some, some feedback gave me some, some smart advices for how to, you know, to start my career or to develop my career. But then in 2006, I was injured in the second Lebanon war. And two or three weeks after my injury, when I was back in at my home, already out of, of the hospital, I one day got a phone call from Amos and he heard that I was injured and he was very, very, um, you know, uh, worried. And he asked me, how do I, how do I feel? And, and, and he started to tell me that he has his own sim similar story in a way. He was injured in, a, in, a, in, another, in another world that we had in Israel. Um, and then a couple of calls later, he already invited me to come and basically help him be his assistant in two weeks in Sri Lanka. We went there to uh, photograph elephants and and leopards, and I learned more about photography during these two two weeks than I learned about uh, photography, you know, in film school. Um, and and but I also learned, you know, I also kind of got to know him better, and um, I realized that he has a story to tell. And um, that was 2007 or 2008. Only in 2010 we realized me and my co-director, Danny Menkin, which is important to mention, um, that uh, the story of Amos, first of all, is a very Israeli story for me, even though he's living in the States for 40 something years. It's a very Israeli story. It's also an international story. And um, that we want to tell this story with him as we go on an expedition to take the pictures that he's still missing, which is the polar bear picture underwater, which was his idea, not my, not ours, of right. course. Um, and that's it. And that's how it started. And it, we, it took us many, many years to complete this film. Ten years, to be wow. quiet. Um, I, I'm really interested because the the work of being a photographer and you know these images of you underwater, it feels very solitary in a way. It's you and the and the great big sea. I mean, there's a team helping you. Um, but you're really on your own path. And I wonder what it was like for you to, or if, if it was easy for you to agree to have Yoni, who I guess you've known for a while, but still to have a camera following you as opposed to you being the holder of the camera. The work of the work of photographer is not necessarily alone. It happened, un unfortunately, because there are not too many people which are willing to be, uh, or they are good enough to be second. Uh, with the photographer. In case of Yoni, which is a case of, as Yoni mentioned, is an Israeli story. And the education, I must say, and I must admit, is part of the military. And be able to excel working in such a um, cohesive unit uh, during the training and during the service that take long for three years and eventually during a war and being wounded, there is an element that you cannot abstract just from life or take away from anywhere in life and put them together. So it worked very well between Yoni and I, Similar, mainly, in my view anyway, mostly because of that background that led us. Yoni was able to accept from me and I was able to accept from him. And together we create, it was in harmony that it worked very well. Till today, despite 
all the ups and downs and the different direction things going. And despite the fact that more people coming into the team, but not all of them have the same background. Uh, the background between a connection between Yoni and I remain the same despite the up and down. It is the foundation for that. That is, so if I look at other photographers beside myself, yes, there are many of them remain alone because it's not very easy for a person to be second to a photographer for a very long period of time. When I started, I was second also to one of the leading fashion photographer in Israel. Mm. And I learned from him. It did not, I could not stay there for very long. Uh, yes, I've been there for eight, nine, eight or nine months. We had very good relationship and good relationship still today. And he and his wife, after 40 years, came to see the movie in Israel <laughs> together with Yoni. It was fantastic. But to be second for a long time in the world of being able to express yourself is not something that many people can carry. And all the compliment to Yoni that he had the spirit, the soul, and the personality to do it stayed with me and together created for such a long period of time till today. It's, it's a, I mean, it's the relationship comes through because I think there is a real intimacy in the film and you get to, I thought one of the really interesting choices was to have all of these people in your life and people who you worked with um, reflecting on why they think you do this work. And I thought it was really interesting that it wasn't, that your words about your, um, about your motivation didn't come in until later in the film. Um, I'm curious from both of you, from Yoni, I'm curious about why you tried to structure, why you decided to structure the film that way, and also from you about what it was like to hear these outside reflections on, on your motivation and your work. Um, For me, um, I think that, first of all, in order to create relationship like, like we have Amos and, and I, um, and in, in generally in, in all my all my documentaries, you know, they really, uh, we really need to, um, to have time and trust and time build trust and, and trust is growing with time. It's not, you can't, I don't think we could have made this film two or three years after I met Amos. We needed a lot of time to build the trust uh, for him and for us to go on this adventure because it was a, it was, it was a dangerous one um, from many many aspects, you know, uh, financially and and even, you know, something could happen to us and or something could happen to Amos and then what would I feel about it? Which was my biggest worry, you know, what will happen if Amos or Adam Ravich which we should mention, which was underwater with him. What, what would I, how would I feel if the person which I consider as my mentor, uh, which I consider as someone that I love and respect, and I make a film about him, and he's going and swimming with a bear, and he's get, getting killed, you know, then, or something happened to him. How, do, how will I feel with myself? So that was one of the responsibilities that I felt and, and almost actually helped me a lot to get over it. He just said, you know, I'm going to do it with or without you. So you better come and join, you know? <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, that was, a, but I really think that, um, you know, yeah, documentary is always about that. You is always about trust. It's always, always about time. And I kind of forgot your question. I'm so sorry. I'm, I, I was asking, well, I think that, you know, you had this, you had your own relationship with Amos and then in the film you ask um, many uh, other yeah, yeah, people yeah. Okay. about, about their sort of perception yeah. of Amos. Yeah. So, so yeah. I, when I, when I make film, I'm trying to reflect uh, the story that I see in my eyes, you know, and the story for me, Amos, as a, when I met him, he was a very mysterious person. You know, when I asked ask him personal questions, he didn't want to ask, he didn't want to answer. When I asked him about the past, he said, the past is the past. We live in the present. The present is present. And we can speak about the future, but forget about the past. The past is not important. And I always thought that the past is important because the past is, is a part of us, you know, is a part of our present and it's, it's a part of how do we see life. So for me, Amos was a mysterious person and then I started to speak with people, 
at the beginning without camera to try to get more information. You know, I knew that he was in the 73 war and, and he actually directed me to some of his friends, some of them he didn't speak with for years and they gave me some more information and then his sister gave me some more information and then his colleagues gave me some more information. So we built it up slowly, slowly and to be quite honest, almost really opened up only in the Canadian Arctic. He mm. didn't, something in this beautiful, pure nature, I think opened him up and, and you could see it in the film. It was totally natural. We didn't push him to do that. You can't push Amos to do anything, you know? It came because he was in the right time and in the right place. So uh, that's why we kind of edited the, the film the same way, you know? We, we, we get pe people that speaks about this you know, this, this uh, silence protagonist. And then you build this tension, you build this curiosity about him. And then when it comes up and he, and he doesn't give all the answers, he gives only some of the answers. And um, I, I know that some of the, the people that spoke about Amos, Amos is not, is not, um, um, is not, uh, doesn't, doesn't think that everything that they say is the, the truth. It's not, the tr it's not his truth, the truth of, of his sister or whatever, but you can ask him about it. I mean, it's an interesting, and I, I will, but I, I do think it's interesting that you hear these words, but we're still seeing you, Amos, um, at your w working, and we're just hearing these voices, and we don't actually see the images of, you know, what the, your sisters look like until the very end. And there's an interesting parallel to sort of the way we look and put meaning um, onto photographs as well. You know, it's sort of the opposite. We're, we're, we're not, or we're only seeing, I'm not sure what, what it is quite, but there's a nice, there's something that I haven't quite figured out that works in an interesting way with photography and sort of the, um, be, be seeing and not hearing or hearing and not seeing. Um, so I thought it was an, an interesting way to do it. I would love to hear um, your feelings about hearing what your sisters and your friends had to say about, about you and, and sort of how that, squares with your own, um, with your own vision I, of yourself. I, am I allowed to say something about Yoni? He said plenty about you, so. <laughs> <laughs> so y Yoni has a special, a very unique spirit. We don't find it in many people. And he's very extraordinarily sensitive and really able to touch and to express in words and his camera um, a very unique element of individual. And he went to the beginning and he did uh, uh, Dolphin Boy and how he continued with me and uh, actually, uh, my brother, the heroes and about Wilfield. And of course he did the famous TED, uh, uh, TED presentation just a few months ago about post-trauma. And that was, that is Yoni. That is Yoni is able to get deep, deep into the deeper level of the individual and I must give him the compliment and in public and to offer hopefully in next week also with Christiana Manpuro that he helped me and the movie and his work, his question and his exploration and dealing with my past as he said correctly the past indeed is something that made us but it helped me to be connected with that that I tried to push back. Interestingly enough just because it is very Israeli um, one of my friends in the service in the Sayeret Shaked uh, is about writing a book about post-trauma and about especially the, the unit and our memory of this. I'm supposed to sit today and write to him mm. and I'm in a dilemma because I honestly, there are so many things, as you said, I try to block, I, don't tr I did not try, I did block the past, the fire, the explosion, the smell, the, all those things that are terrorized, and I terrorized me or some of us, I don't remember the name of the people. I try to extract the name of the people that were with me there and I cannot even bring them up. I have the picture, yes, I can see the eyes, but I cannot remember the name. So the, the work that Yoni did was remarkable and bring up a lot of those injured or moment that when, when I was to them or together with them and raised enough money to do it, to be in the high Arctic, I've, I felt there are many bridges crossed on many walls fall apart like you take, take off from the onion, you take la layer by layer by layer 
coming, and it's not over yet. It's not over, it's still continuously, uh, every conversation as such right today, and preparation for talking to, um, to Christina Manporo, and she wants to talk about post-trauma. <laughs> tomorrow, Amos, it's tomorrow, it's not next week. You told tomorrow. me next week. <laughs> this week. So it is, it's, very, um, it's very important to me, and I'm blessed to have the opportunity to connect the past that I left behind and what I'm doing today. And as you mentioned, very interesting, Ariana. Um, yes, I took all the tools that I had before, and rather than to look at them as war and fighting and hurting and killing and who knows what else, or saving people, try to do it totally into total other environment. The blue was for me, I, I, did, not, I did not know. <laughs> I went after my heart, that's all what I did. I left everything to my heart and, and I went to the blue, or I went to the desert in the Sinai. And then into the water, it was like, there is another world that we hardly touch. And it is healing. And it is colorful. It is fascinating in its exploration. And very little was known about many of the animals, like the one sitting behind me. I find another world to challenge myself in, rather than to fight or to struggle on the street of New York or the street, well, I was taxi driver in New York, don't forget that. I want to hear about that too. <laughs> And it's almost like a war. Israel, yeah. Israel. And when I, when I was growing up in Israel, it was the time of shortage in the early 50s. I remember standing online as a kid and trying to get some milk and bread to bring home. Yeah. So my life went through some, apparently some contrast and some struggle. My, my heart was aspired to someplace else rather than what is right now in the front of us. My heart was aspire to something else, and I followed my heart despite the difficulty and not paying attention to what my friends are doing or they become lawyers or, or contractor or high tech and everything. I stayed with my heart that brings us till today. And I am really so happy and so delightful. And the movie was just unbelievable moment. And now this week, as we go online to share it to the world. It's, um, there's a line you say in the film about um, seeking out the beauty in the world instead of its misery. And, I, and I, that struck me, and I think it's a really beautiful sentiment. Um, and hearing you talk now, thinking about as much as you can seek the beauty, or as Yonatan said earlier, the, the idea of living in the present, you can't really fully step away from, from the past. And it's, it's interesting to see the way those intersect as you try to move forward. Um, and, you know, I'm sort of thinking about um, the now and the future. Um, I want to sort of transition to your work um, in conservation, because I think when we're appreciating the beauty of the world now, it's, it's impossible not to think about um, what the world might look like in another. You said um, two thirds of the, of the polar bear population may be gone by 2050. I mean, that's a staggering number. Um, I'm curious about your work and also I'm curious, you know, a lot of the conversation um, about if there's any silver lining to what's going on with COVID is that um, a lot of, some of the climate change stuff has been delayed. Um, and I'm wondering if any of the polar bear populations have sort of come back in the past few months or if it's too soon to know. It is too soon to know. Indeed, it's a very short period of time. We're talking about four months or five months from February till now or January till now. Um, we, we do know from the people that I work with, the operator up there, because I could not go there, <laughs> that there, are, um, there is more ice, and uh, there are, they are seen, or some of them, some people report, few, they did not know if there are many more polar bears, because nobody go out to check them out or to count them. But some reporting, seeing them more often than before. Mm. We don't know if the same one or other one. Only next season will tell, really, next time when we are able to get there. Uh, I'm planning to be there next April, early April, um, to be there again. Um, and then we'll know better, uh, really. The, la the population of the polar bear will not grow automatically. They bring only one, well, 70% of the time they bring only one, one calf. 
Mm. Uh, another 15 or 20 percent they bring two and less than 10 percent they bring three even though they bring up to three or two only one of the cub will survive wow. because is a survive the survive this the fittest of the survival between the boy between the cubs so it will take very long time for them to recover the question the the, the issue is really the challenge about food supply the more ice the more seals make hole in the ice, the more food the polar bear have. The less ice, less uh, holes, less seal for them to catch, then they will have to survive on grass or birds, uh, eggs, or go into civilization. And that is the dilemma that we are facing. Unfortunately, and I, may, I don't mind to mention it in this setup, what our present doing is out of the ordinary and very destructive for the future generation. Opening the high Arctic refuge for exploration, it is a no-no. Uh, opening Utah and Arizona and other um, uh, land that was divided, supposed to be parked, uh, parking area or for parks or conservation is a no-no. And Alaska, the same thing, that we are in difficult time that need to change and need to be conserved and protected for all humanity. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that message beautifully comes through in the film. I mean, not, not in terms of, you know, specific things we are doing, but I think hearing about polar bears going in, starving polar bears and attacking humans, or um, you're, you're speaking about um, doing this work as a way to sort of show what might not be there and, and seeing these images. And, and I mean, it's, it's really heartbreaking to, to hear, hear you talk about the possibility of losing this when looking at such beauty. Um, I, I, if you can, I would love to know a little bit about what, how you realized that first polar bear was dangerous and, and what it felt like to be down there and then, and then sort of what it felt like to be back down there, having just had this experience with the other bear and then, um, and then being able to take that picture. I mean, it, your joy comes across, but I think if you can talk a little bit about that really terrifying seeming moment. <laughs> I would not go back in the water after that, let me tell you. Okay. We have to look at it in such a way to, to understand. When people like yourself or Yoni that not been with polar bear before, with animal of such before, or anyone else, or Danny that was with us, look at it from the point of view from the outside. And anybody looking at it today, it's very difficult for them to imagine. So a lot of fear and a lot of um, what they call it, fake media come to their mind and immediately to survivor and, and, and feel safe. How do you feel safe or not afraid? It's very different for people like Adam and myself that we dedicated so much of our life to be in the wilderness with a camera. And then the camera become our main tools and we put, our, we put our soul in the front of the camera and only the, the body behind the camera to take the picture. So our concentration is on taking the picture at a time. There is no time for fear because if there was a time for fear, if there is fear we take over, there is no picture taken. <laughs> and that is, and I can say to myself, that's something that we take from the service. That's something that Yoni took, and that's why, unfortunately, he got injured. And when he took the, the courage to go and look for mines, and eventually they blew up on the mine, and some of his friend, a friend injured or died, and he himself got injured, or what happened to me during the, the service, and during, especially the war in 73, and then after this in Gaza, and, check, and, uh, and dealing with the t terrorism in Gaza. So... You can, when you are motivated in the moment to do something and you are motivated, you are driven, there is nothing else left and you decide to do that, you don't think about fear anymore. Mm -hmm. There was very interesting story, of course, from World War II and also recently also about of the, one of the Israeli military nurses that went to save people. And, and there was a television piece about it in Israel about him that despite the fact that they were under fire and their commander got injured, 
this person, this nurse, uh, military, how do you call him, Yoni, the um, Chovesh Krovi? A military doctor or whatever, military, military uh, nurse. Me so, Better. yeah, so, um, so he went despite he was under fire and they're aiming at him and he ran full speed in open field to reach to this commander and to save him. Unfortunately, the commander died later on, but for this, war, this he got, uh, of course, a compliment, of, uh, mili um, uh, they call it a medal of, a medal of uh, respect and honor. So when you are committed to do something and there is nothing left behind, you concentrate on the, on a, on a it's not, it's the inner calling, it's not even a duty anymore, <laughs> it's inner calling. And then whatever come out of it and that is the, the success of what Yoni and Danny did, willing to go to make this movie despite all the obstacles, the fear, the concern, the money, that everything else and all the no, no, no that people told them so many notes for 10 years mm. and that's what it takes to be successful and that's why we are here today and thank you Danny again and Yoni and Danny too <laughs> <laughs> it's a remarkable feat I, I want to uh, just let everyone who's watching know if you have questions you can um, ask in the in the Q&A box um, I, I before we open up to questions for the audience I, I want to talk because I think you know, you talk about this moment at the end where you're, you make it happen and the film comes together and watching it for the third time um, to prepare for this, I was crying at the end of the film. I mean, it's a really moving moment. And, um, and I think, of course, the music there, the Leonard Cohen song, Anthem, helps uh, bring out those emotions. And it's such a perfect song. Can you talk a little bit about your choice to, to yeah. play the Leonard Cohen song at the end there? This is, by the way, Yoni talent. <laughs> he, he, he's, so, he's so sensitive to those moments. And he had such an unique skills to bring those things to an epic. OK, thank you, Amos. <laughs> um, I think that um, Blush, it's OK. The, tele the television do very good to you when you are sm uh, blushing. <laughs> um, I think that. Um, uh, you know, I just read, the, I, I heard this song one day and um, when we were editing the film and we had two options actually, one song by Neil Young, which we really liked, um, but it didn't fit for, to the, for the end of the film, it, it could fit earlier. And we realized that we can't afford to have Leonard Cohen and Neil Young in the same film. And also that it will be too much to have two iconic songs in one film. So we decided that we're gonna go with Leonard Cohen because the lyrics of this of this song are so, for me, they're just uh, really the story of Amos, you know? Um, there is a crack in everything and that's how the light gets in, you know? you If you're perfect and your life were perfect and everything went smoothly, then I think you're very limited in in the in, in you know in in what you can create. The beauty that you can create is limited. But if you've been through really 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 tough times in your life, um, then you can appreciate beauty when something beautiful is happening. Then you you feel it because you've been on the other side as well, uh, and you can be. Um, you know, you can be appreciative for this beauty. And I think what Amos is doing with his camera is what the psychologists call reframing. He took his story and he reframed it. He, he, and that's, by the way, what we all, all of us are doing all the time. You know, we, we, um, we look at the reality, which is very complex, and you can look at it for so many directions. And we as storytellers, Amos with his camera, me as a documentary filmmaker, and in, and in many ways, all of us, we always decide what out of this um, very complex reality that surrounds us every, every second, we want to put in the frame and what we want to uh, uh, leave aside. And that's an amazing power, I think, that the camera gives us, especially when we're dealing with traumas and with pain and with you know, with, with difficulties like all of us, you know, 
you can use the camera, you can also use your eyes and your ears and your brain to, to uh, see the, 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 the reality in a different way, to listen to different things, to edit the story in a different way with your, with your mind, you know? And I think that uh, when I heard this song, there is a crack in, every, in everything and that's how the, the light gets in, it was exactly what we looked for. And then we just had to find the money to pay for it. But uh, we, we, did that, we did that too, and we're still doing it. Um, but yeah, I love Leonard Cohen. It's a huge re uh, honor for us to, to have him as part of our film, you know? It's, it's, yeah. it's amazing, his deep voice and his amazing lyrics, and it all, you know, leads to the closure where Amos is putting the the picture of this family of bears on the grave of his father. Um, so that's what we try to do. Yeah, I mean, in a way, the film also acts as the light coming in through this crack of um, the narrative that almost you were creating and sort of making you revisit and, and reframe your past. So it's, and also, of course, talking about light in photography is always beautiful as well. And, and also, you know, you, you know, it's, I think that Amos really has taken his, his very difficult experiences and transform them, transform them into beauty. And yeah. this is something that, uh, and he's not, he's, he's not aiming a gun at anyone anymore for many, many years, thank God, but he's aiming a camera and he's creating beauty. He's not killing anyone. He's not, yeah. you know, hurting anyone. He's not on the side who's been hurt by other people. Uh, but he's just using the camera to create beauty, to connect people to nature, to connect people to each other, to help people deal with their, their own fears. I mean, because Amos is also leading expeditions with people who wants to dive with sharks or whales or leopard seals or, or polar bears. Uh, not maybe polar bears. I mean, he's not maybe diving with polar bears. Maybe, maybe you're planning to do that too. I have no idea. <laughs> Uh, to take uh, tourists to, to, to do that, but he's basically helping people get over their fears. That's what he's doing. And that's what he did with me. I was very afraid to make this film. Mm -hmm. um, and it, and he, he convinced me that it's possible. Um, I, I love the scene where you bring the picture to your father's grave. And I also think um, there's that moment where your father calls you a gibor and says you're a hero. And, and I wonder what that, you know, the film sort of dealt with this relationship that seems like it was, it was a difficult one and, and there was a lot of sweetness at the end with, with the way your father looked, spoke about you and then um, you going to his grave. I, I wonder what that was like for you. Talking to me or yeah. to you? <laughs> to, for, to you. <laughs> uh, yes, the relationship with my dad were very difficult, um, very traumatic in a way. And that's one of the things that contribute the fact that I wanted to leave and to follow my heart rather than the duty being a son and being in Israel, part of the tradition, part of the people that came from Northern Africa and all those things that become stigmatic in the Israeli or Jewish environment or social environment at the time. Um, my vision, as many kids today, we all been exposed. My vision was exposed to other um, elements outside of the tradition and more, many temptation and uh, the temptation of the camera, the temptation to create beauty, the temptation to be in the wilderness, all those things that uh, turn me on. Um, dogs and horses, as we only remember, together we went horseback riding in Israel. Um, so th those things that created the difficult with me was my father. Um, fortunately enough for me, I realized in the early 30s that I will not need anymore, I don't want emotionally or physically. I, I went through, I worked with a shaman from Hawaii on this particular issue about the, the family or the parents' recognition. Uh, this was very important in the Jewish tradition or any tradition of humanity. I realized that I will probably will never get it because I was already in America. He was in Israel, we did not talk for many years. So there was no way to bridge it or to visit it as often as necessary. I had to be able to live without it. And it did well for me. Unfortunately, it did not well, did well for him until 
Yoni did, Yoni Vedani did amazing moment, which they able to capture him in the hospital, which I never knew oh, wow. till I saw the movie. Wow. That for me was really a very big point that right now even I, I feel the shake in my skin uh, to think about it and to talk about it because of the so many layers that led to this particular time. So again, if I did not say enough, Yoni, mm -hmm. thank you and Danny for being able to be there at the right time in the right place, making a big change in the relationship. I wasn't sure if you were in the room and that, I mean, it's, oh. it's really beautiful. Um, there is a bunch of questions coming in. Um, one of them is about the uh, being in the camp in the Canadian Arctic and working with that incredible group of people. And, and obviously uh, the film is dedicated to two of them. Um, can you talk about meeting them and, and what it was like to work with them? Um, for Amos, it was not the first time in the Arctic, but for me, it was the first time in the Arctic. And um, I, I just, you know, I'll, I'll never forget these people. This is amazing, amazing human beings. They're so connected to you, to nature, much more than us. They are the masters of of the Arctic, like the Bedouins in the in in the desert. They know how to to live in this. Um, this this very difficult environment and they're so um how they say um humble you know they're so humble they just the way they speak the way they wait you know it's the waiting game it's all about waiting it's all about waiting for the right time um we are a, a very small part of this big universe and you feel it when you go to Nunavut, which is a, 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 a territory which is bigger than Israel, uh, 90 times bigger than Israel, with 35,000 people, you feel that you are a very small part uh, of, of nature, of the universe, and it makes you feel connected, and it puts you in the right place, you know? And I really enjoy this feeling. And I really enjoy it, and I enjoy it also when I have a camera in my hand because I um, I have to let go of my ego, and I have to let go of my fears, and I have to let go, and I have to fill my heart with 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 trust and love, and hope. That's the only way to survive there. That's the only way to to create this kind of film. You have no other way. If you try to take con to, to to take control and to, you know, to be the director, you know, I'm going to direct what is happening there. You're going to go into clash with nature. And this is not good, especially not when you're in the Canadian Arctic, 500 kilometers from the closest human being. So it, it kind of, and, and to do that, you have to work with the best experts in the world, people like Amos and Adam. And you have to have some experience, which I had in different environment, but it helped me a bit, uh, or the military service or whatever, to, to prepare this kind of operation. It's an operation. It's like three months working night by night, making sure that you have everything covered. And it's hundreds of things to take care of, maybe thousands of things to take care of. And everything needs to be prepared, and yet you have zero control. And that's a very weird situation, but that's what we have to deal with in the kind of documentaries that I make. You have no control and it's a journey and, it's, uh, and it will bring you what you need to get. Mm. You have to accept it. So, uh, and then you meet the Inuit people and they're exactly like that. They are so connected to this flow that, you know, that nature has this ups and downs, high tide, low tide, uh, bad weather, good weather, <laughs> you know, it's all, it's part of their life. And then you become one with it. When you become one with it, it makes it easier for you. And I'm full of appreciation to the Kalujak family. We also had the opportunity to meet them again uh, on Zoom, of course, mm -hmm. a couple of weeks ago to have a nice talk with them. Um, uh, the little kid, Leo Kalujak, is now very big one, very big kid. He's five years older. Yeah. He's very strong. 
Um, yeah, and we dedicated the film to two of the guys, which are really amazing human beings. There was a nice parallel where you went from talking about, I guess it was, it was um, about Amos and his father and then moving um, to teaching, the father teaching his, um, I'm, for, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting. It was a Joe who was teaching his son. Joe and, to, yeah, Joe yeah. Jr. and Leo. Yeah. yeah, and teaching him how to carry on a tradition and these questions of what your father passes on to you. I, I, I mm -hmm. thought it was a really interesting um, <laughs> sort of tragic parallel, but, but it was, um, you know, this idea but, you know, of I, I think preservation you, you, you spoke, of tradition. You, you spoke with Amos before about the scene with his father. Um, we... Also in Dolphin Boy, Danny and I um, dealt with father-son relationship. It's an interesting, it's a very universal um, e issue. Uh, pain, trauma is a very universal issue that I always try to, uh, not always try, but I, I find myself touching in my own films, um, you know, struggling with something and, 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 and trying to overcome limitations and fears. This is something I always deal with the connection between men and nature is something that I always deal with uh, the healing nature, the healing uh, connection of between men and nature. Um, and there is sometimes in documentary films, you create the reality. You don't document the reality, you create the reality. And this example that Amos just gave you about him, not he was not there yeah. to hear his father tell him how much he loves him, but he did tell it to the camera and we captured it. And when Amos came to Israel to, um, after his father died, I told him, I have something to show you. And um, the same day we show, on, in his sister's house, not far away from the grave of his father, uh, we showed him the scene where his father is telling him, I'm proud of you, blah, 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 I love you and all this. And then we went to the grave and put this picture on his grave. I don't think any of that would happen without the film. Yeah. And this is what I call docu-therapy. It's the way that documentary films can actually support a, a process of post-traumatic growth. Um, and, and, and you can do it with, you know, you can use other arts to do this kind of process. You can use writing or um, painting or whatever, but there is something in documentary films where you really, really follow someone and you help him get out of himself what he really wants to do. And you, and sometimes you also, because if we would ask Amos, what is the film that you want to do? It would have been a different film. But we thought, Danny and I, that this is the right story to tell for him. Uh, and he accepted it. He, he trusted us, you know, and... Beautiful. Um, it, it is this, this sort of outsider coming in and, and, and reflecting together. I mean, I think that's, it's, it's in, in all of your films, it really has come across and um, it's beautifully done here. Mm -hmm. there's, a, there's an interesting question from Anya Soutman. Um, I care deeply about climate change, but my work also requires a lot of travel. I wonder how you almost strike the balance between living environmentalism in your daily work. Your trips require traveling to a lot of different places, carrying a lot of equipment, staying in very remote areas. How do you think the trade-off between going to these places and documenting the landscape and wildlife and protecting them, perhaps by not going there? So how do you sort of navigate um, having to travel and you know, travel itself being, having an environmental impact uh, with the work you're doing as taking photographs to try to preserve the world as it is? Yeah, it is a difficult question uh, that um, I, I have to live with the reality of that, like all of us who are working in the environment uh, or want to work in the environment, to get there, we need to use plane and cars and vehicle and that burning fuel and we are spouting to the universe more of the CO2. It is part of the price we pay. The, the challenge, the, the opposite side of that, if we may, we bring something um, educational, hopefully. We bring our vision, what we see. Uh, for example, if we raise it in the point, in one of the trips that I did recently, just not long ago, to, um, to Indonesia, 
in the island of uh, the Komodo Island. As we got off the boat and on the way to walk up, up the hill and look at these beautiful vistas, many, many people coming there because um, it's very close to China, of course, Japan, and all Southeast Asia, and especially Indonesia, of 600 million or more people live there. And it is very popular to go. But there is so much garbage, so much pollution on the coast. One of the things that apparently nobody have done, and I suggested there, and slowly is now being implemented, everybody come on the island, go for the first 10 minutes and clean whatever they can pick up from the beach, put in a bag. So if I did not take the plane and fly there and spout so much CO2 up in the air, I will never see that I never contribute to something more. So every picture I bring, the, the, the chance for people that join me and put them in the water with a great white and out of the cage, no protection, and not challenging the shark and not aggravating the shark, but go naturally into the water with them and to be able to see it. When they come back home, they, yes, they go on a flight, they use the car, or they use lift or, or um, their own car. But when they go out to work and tell the story and we're changing every person, one person at a time attitude toward the environment and the true information compared to what the movie Jaws did we can do something different. Um, that is the equation. That's how I can justify that. If I need to justify that, yeah. we don't have yet, unfortunately, a um, plane that operate on uh, cell fuel or on electric. And also we don't have uh, trucks that take us like Tesla and to the airport. <laughs> but it's getting bigger. Yeah. 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 Um, I'll, I'll, now that you're, you're talking about all of these trips, so we have a question from Joyce Pastor about what your next photographic challenge is. And, mm -hmm. and I'm curious if, if any of your trips got canceled because of the, your inability to travel right now, if you had anything planned that you'll be picking back up. Okay. So yes, I organize and I lead expedition around the world. This is the only way which I could subsidize everything that I've done till today. And I will say again, as I said many times, and I'll say it every time, Thank God and thank for the American public trusting me and join me in 45 years to be able to come to this point. So God bless America. And for the people in America that were willing to, or uh, believed in me, trusted and followed me till today and today also for this opportunity. The website for my expedition is biganimals.com. Uh, I did not cancel any trip. I did not have to cancel them. They just mm. did not take place. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody could fly. And I did not fight with anybody. I returned over a quarter million dollars in deposit and payment on trip. Um, some people decide to stay for next year and to be able to join me next year. These people had more than others. But people needed, people needed the money back. And of course, I paid it back. And people that want to stay, they stayed with me for next year. So the polar bear people that I had to, to, to postpone in April of this year, they're coming back next year. The people that want to go with the Orca and the Mobile Array to Mexico in May, June, that's supposed to be now, are going next year. The people that's supposed to come with me to South Africa to be with the Sardine one next month, they will go next year. So things are good. Uh, we look at positive aspects toward the future. There is um, potential. We just need to hold on and to, to know that actually the corona or the virus is so small that no aircraft carrier and no atomic bomb and no bombast over the media and not the president, only the mask in our face and wherever we go, we and to distance, um, social distancing, we are be able to defeat it and to maintain, protect ourselves and the one around us. That's the only way right now and nothing else is the matter. The future, yes, the time, the time in, um, at home, not traveling, allow me to think profoundly more about new things that we're planning on. And one of the things that I, some of them I can talk about, some of them I will not talk about them, so they are in the future. But one of them is to photograph the Siberian tiger oh. and to be able to go to Siberia after that period, which luckily there is plus perhaps more ground for the Siberian tiger to go out and the chance to be able to photograph them, but not just to take a picture of them, 
Lucky Sepper was a polar bear. My work is mainly to be able to capture behavior of those animals, the relationship either between two adults, adult and a young one, to be able to bring more of a life, the intimacy, the emotion of being in the wilderness. And the other project that I'm very keen uh, to do and very and really luckily enough to find a team to do it with is going to a place in the world that call the Blue Well Cafe. So just to mention that the Blue Well is actually the modern time dinosaur. It is bigger than all the dinosaurs ever live on the planet wow. as far as size. It could not live during the time of the dinosaur on the planet because they will be killed. And now it's still among us. Unfortunately, not many of them left, only 12 to 15,000 from over a quarter of a million of them that were on the planet. We hunt them almost to, the, to extinction. But since 1968, since the ban on whaling, they are coming slowly into greater number. There is a particular place in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, about 200 miles off the coast of Costa Rica, that so much wind, wind is very powerful into this place, this location, that impossible to get there. Matter of fact, BBC and National Geographic tried it about 11 or 12 years ago, and they were knocked out. I tried it six, six or seven years ago. I got knocked out, <laughs> but now we found a way to do it. It has to be like operating the SEAL 6, like going the SEAL 6, really being embedded in Costa Rica for two or three weeks. We'll go to the rainforest, we go to the ocean, very close to the ocean, not 200 miles, we go to only the first 10 or 15 miles. We'll be with dolphin, we'll be in a, in, a, in a rainforest. But when the wind stops down, usually it's a period of time that we know now, approximately day plus or day minus when it's going to happen. We're going to take the boat with only four people and we're going to go out there where blue whale, say well, uh, fin well, all of the largest animal ever living on the planet come there to feed on all of the plankton, all the good food that come from the bottom of the ocean because of the wind, it's come up to the surface and then we are able to be there with them. And that's wow. what we're planning for next year. That's two, but there is also develop more trip right now inside the continent of United States and Canada, because we cannot fly very far. We don't know what will happen in so many other countries. However, between Canada and United States, there is in the next month or two, hopefully more open and we can go to Alaska, we can go to Yellowstone and I'm looking into doing more of the wolf and more of the bears and more of the, uh, the uh, national parks photography continue being able for people to be able to enjoy or practice their ability to photograph the big animals. Wow, I, I can't wait to see those photos of the of the whales converging, and it's it's called the Blue Whale Cafe. Is that what? Blue Whale Cafe. Wow, so Jonathan, you'll have to be fight your way on to be one of those four and get us the film. Um, the Costa Rica Dome. Wow. Costa Rica Dome. Wow. Um, I want to ask also, there's a question here from Mary, a great question. She, someone who was in Nanavut two years ago and, and appreciated how much the Inuit were a part of this film. Um, she's asking how she can see the film again and she wants to show it to her family. So, uh, Jonathan, if you want to take that one yeah actually we are <clears throat> one of the reasons that we speak with you today um, is to uh, encourage you to um, if you haven't seen the film or if you know someone that will enjoy watching this film we're gonna come out with this film on a virtual theatrical release with more than 80 different um, uh, cinemas around uh, the United States and with many, many, in partnership with many, many, many other organizations uh, like Mission Blue and other organizations. Uh, and you are able to actually, one of the uh, institutes or organization that we uh, join forces with is the Boston Jewish Film Festival. And they have a specific link where you can actually, maybe you can put the link even on the, on the chat or they will send it later on the newsletter. But basically, you go uh, from Friday, you go on this link, 
and you can watch the film for $9.99 and um, the profit goes to the filmmakers and to the production, but also to, the, to, the, uh, to support the, the, the Boston Jewish Film Festival, uh, which we love and respect and have long relationship with. Um, and this way uh, we can't, you know, open in cinemas, but you're still able to watch the film and we would love it if you like the film and you want to write a couple of good words about it um, to your friends on Facebook or whatever, uh, we would be really appreciative to that. Um, start from this Friday, uh, Picture of His Life, a virtual theatrical release. It's hard to remember the, the, this new concept. It's a whole new concept. And you're more than welcome to join us um, and watch the film um, and that's it and tomorrow we're going to be on CNN on Friday we're going to be on New York Times and let's see what that will bring but you saw it here first <laughs> um, I'm not sure we're going to be tomorrow on CNN not tomorrow, tomorrow. We'll the test. it's my tomorrow it's not your tomorrow it's my tomorrow we should say Yonatan is in Israel it's right now it's <laughs> one o'clock in the morning there so we should let you go soon but as 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 he said, the film um, is going to be available starting on June 19th, um, and we do have a very special partnership link that we'll be sending out uh, via email and also on our social media. So um, there will be, please look there um, and share that with your friends. And it's really, it's, this is a film I love very much and I saw, you know, months and months ago back when we showed it in November and it's, it's thrilling to be able to share it so widely with the world and get so many people to hear, um, there are so many important messages in the film, so share those and also um, make people you know, aware of your work, Jonathan and, and Danny's, but also um, of yours, Amos, and um, I'm gonna start saving money to get, get on one of your trips because they look spectacular. Uh, to say the website one more time so people can, can join you if they're able. Well, the website is uh, biganimals.com. Big animals, and then pictureofhislife.com. Um, the other. Come for the movie yeah. for the movie so so check them both out and thank you to everyone who joined us tonight um and a huge thank you to Yonatan and Amos um, it was wonderful to speak with you tonight and Adriana, we're getting lots of thank yous on the Adriana thank you too for keeping us for so long entertained with the question and learning from each other <laughs> it's been wonderful so have a good night get some sleep Yonatan Amos enjoy your day and and we'll see you all soon. Bye. Bye-bye. Ciao. Bye -bye.